moderate Republican, and he replaced a moderate Republican, Powell. Um, we're talking about Justice Scalia, you know, the staunchest conservative on the court, and we're talking about him being replaced by someone who could dramatically flip the uh, balance of power on the court. It's not a lateral move. Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I am Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response at FFRF. That clip was Amy Coney Barrett discussing the impropriety of filling an open Supreme Court seat during an election, especially if it happens to flip the ideology of that seat on the court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a titan with an outsized legacy, died on Friday, September 18th in the evening. I got the news at about 5.45 p.m. The White House called Barrett on Saturday morning, told her to come to D.C. on Sunday. She accepted the nomination on Monday, less than 72 hours after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. Barrett and her clear unfitness for the high court is the topic of today's Ask an Atheist. And as always, if you've got questions, you can ask them right here in the Facebook comments, or you can send an email to ask an atheist at ffrf.org. That is ask an atheist at ffrf.org. And I am really pleased today because I have as my guest Andrew Torres, an attorney, a podcast host, a friend of FFRF, a friend of mine. Uh, Andrew's got a super impressive resume. Graduated from Harvard Law School with honors. He's been recognized as a local litigation star by Benchmark Litigation since 2011. He's a member of many boards and associations. His CV is super impressive. You've worked big law. He's clerked. A whole bunch of other honors to his name. Uh, he's actually helped FFRF with some legal issues. And he is co-host of one of the only podcasts that I listen to regularly, Opening Arguments, which breaks down a popular legal topic in the news. And it gives you all the tools that you need to understand the issue. And more importantly, most importantly, to win every argument you have on Facebook or with your Uncle Frank or whoever else is wrong on the Internet. So, Andrew. Welcome to Ask an Atheist, finally. Uh, wow, Andrew, thank, thank you so much. After that introduction, I feel like I should uh, leave on a high note. So uh, goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Uh, we are trying to get FFRF's legal director, Rebecca Marker, patched in, too. Of course, about two minutes before we wanted to go live, we hit some technical <laughs> difficulties. Her computer seized up, as it is wont to do these days. Uh, so we're, we'll see if we can get her in. Uh, but Andrew, you did a show last Friday, and you talked about Barrett. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on today to help us break down her record. What did you cover on that show besides Barrett? Yeah, so that was our main segment. Um, in our in our A segment, we also talked about the uh, indictment that was handed down by the grand jury in Kentucky of Officer Hankison in connection with the Breonna Taylor case, right? And we uh, also previewed our Tuesday episode, which broke down all of the legal arguments in Barton Gelman's uh, really seminal Atlantic article about what if Trump refuses to leave office, which, uh, you know, you may have a slightly different opinion about uh, after last night's debate. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And I, mean, I, I do have to say that, I mean, this is your opening arguments is it's such a great show because you break down the law in ways that anybody can understand. So if people want to listen to this, if they want to follow, you know, what's the best way for them to do that? Where can they find you and the show? Oh, sure. Um, anywhere you get your podcast, just uh, search for opening arguments or you can follow us on Twitter at open args, O-P-E-N-A-R-G-S. OK, so now let's, Rebecca. let's talk. Hey, hey. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> That's okay. You're here now. So, uh, Rebecca, we I already said we were trying to get you in, uh, and we're we're going to talk right now. We're we've already done all the preliminaries, so we're going to jump right into Barrett's record. And just so everybody knows, FFRF it has a full report up on our website about Barrett. Uh, Bruce has got a little link for it. You can see FFRF.us slash Barrett. That is a work in progress. We are going to be adding to it as we learn more. Uh, so check back at that page regularly. And before we dive into some of the specifics in a record, we have got to talk about what is at stake. Because I think with this nomination, we can no longer seriously consider that this is going to be a Supreme Court concerned with justice and the rule of law, but with codifying the privilege of a distinct minority. So 
The legitimacy of the court is at stake, probably gone, but what else? Rebecca, why don't you jump in and tell us one thing that you know is at stake here since we haven't heard from you yet. Sure. Well, I think the the biggest thing um, that's at stake and um, was part of Trump's litmus test for all of his um, judicial nominees was um, Roe v. Wade and the future of Roe v. Wade. So um, abortion rights are at stake. I think that's absolutely right. I think, too, and Andrew, would love to get your take on this. I think they, they are putting her on the court with the idea that she will write the opinion that overturns Roe or that deals the death blow to Roe. Yeah, I, I've been saying on opening arguments for the past three years that uh, John Roberts would write the opinion. And essentially what we would get would be a redo of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, right? It mm-hmm. would nominally reaffirm the right to an abortion. Uh, but it would so gut that of content uh, that, you know, it would effectively overrule Roe v. Wade, although uh, Roberts, an institutionalist, would not want to see the little red check mark go up on Westlaw. Um, I, we know that, that, the, that the remaining four uh, justices on the right uh, don't care about that. Um, and I think neither does Judge Barrett. So I, I think that view is, is absolutely correct. I've, I've now changed my view on that from we are going to get a redefinition of, you know, what constitutes an undue burden to uh, the, the first step being uh, explicitly overruling Roe versus Wade. And the second step being taking seriously at the Supreme Court, an argument so preposterous that all of us laughed about it in law school, and that is the idea that a fetus is a person under the 14th Amendment. That is the dream of, you know, the the far right, uh, you know, legal think tanks. And I, we may have five votes for that on the Supreme Court, which is it just that's that's unimaginable. And again, this is if Barrett gets confirmed. So this is we are talking about what is at stake right now. And I also want to add, I mean, Rebecca, Roe versus Wade is the big one. And I but I've been thinking a lot, too, about so let if that happens, I imagine it's going to happen pretty quick. But Barrett's going to be on the court for 40 years. A lot of these these Christian nationalists on the court are young. I mean, that shifts the entire legal landscape. And I think one of the things that's coming after that is contraception. I mean, contra- your right to contraception could theoretically be on the table. And we part of the reason that I'm worried about this is because they're going after it in the Affordable Care Act right now. I mean, health care is our health care is absolutely at stake also. Right. Absolutely. Um, 100 percent. And they're actually um, going to be arguing cases about the Affordable Care Act shortly after the election. So if she is confirmed before the election, this is definitely going to be some a case that she's going to be ruling on. And and we know that she's not going to be ruling in favor of of the ACA. Yeah, she's been pretty clear about that. Now, Andrew, you added something. What do you think is another big thing that's at stake here? It, I, I have been raising this uh, as as a cause for alarm uh, for the past three years. Um, uh, it radically changed the landscape, uh, but I think a lot of people forget o- o- Obergefell versus Hodges is yes. five years old. And John Roberts wrote a blistering dissent joined by then Justice Scalia and by Clarence Thomas in that case. And, and I, I want to read a sentence here from, from his dissent, uh, which, which says, uh, this court invalidates the marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis of human society for millennia for the Kalahari Bushmen and the Han Chinese, the Carthaginians and the Aztecs. Just who do we think we are? Um, that is, uh, again, having just sort of discussed John Roberts' institutionalist attitude on the court, um, that is not a reasoned institutionalist moderate dissent. That is a fire-breathing dissent from somebody who is hostile to the notion of same-sex marriage. Um, we, we know Judge Barrett's position on, on same-sex marriage. And uh, 
I, I think that we, we could easily see, um, even on cases that are pending on the docket, the Supreme Court signal as early as the, the this coming fall 2020 term uh, to would-be petitioners, hey, uh, give us a challenge to Obergefell and uh, and we'll take another look at it. And and that would be, you know, truly terrifying and um, and and strikes me as plausible. And again, like I I. I'm I'm usually the guy trying to talk everybody off the ledge, right? Um, but but this really does fundamentally transform the court. I, I think I it's entirely plausible. Go ahead, Rebecca. Oh no, I was just going to say I think that's truly terrifying too, and I think um, everybody realizes that LGBTQ rights are at stake. But I don't think even I personally thought Obergefell would be on the table for um, overturning or reversing in any way. So that's awful. Yeah. I mean, if, if, the, if Obergefell were held after Barrett, let's say Barrett gets on the court and they, then there's the Obergefell case that comes up for the first time, that's a 6-3 decision against equality all of a sudden. I mean, that, yeah. that's the, the only dissent that Roberts has read from the bench. Whether same-sex yeah. marriage is a good idea should be of no concern to us. Under the Constitution, judges have the power to say what the law is, not what it should be. And then he goes on to say the fundamental right to marry does not include the right to make a state change its definition of marriage and a state's decision to maintain the meaning of marriage that has persisted in every culture throughout human history can hardly be called irrational. I mean, Kavanaugh flipped the Kennedy vote. Barrett would flip the RBG vote. Scalia, uh, Gorsuch would maintain the Scalia vote. We're talking 6-3 against. This is, I mean, the, people do not, I 100% agree that that is at stake and people need to realize it. Yeah, and and. Barrett's view on the Seventh Circuit on how to apply constitutionality so as to uh, as to prohibit state laws is an incredibly high threshold, right? If you look at um, at at her ruling in, uh, if you look at at, at her uh, majority opinion in Cook County versus Wolf, for example, or in uh, her her dissenting vote on the. Um, uh, if you look at her dissenting vote in EEOC versus AutoZone, right? Like this is a requirement uh, that there be a threshold of uh, uh, extreme clarity before saying that um, you know that, 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 that in effect something has to be explicitly prohibited in the Constitution as determined by the folks writing it in 1791 right, or 1789 <laughs> uh, that that. Uh, uh, that that an action is prohibited in order to strike it down as unconstitutional. Well, obviously, right? That there is there is no 18th century uh, dictionary that's going to say that the founding fathers intended to protect same sex marriage. They didn't. What they intended to protect was a principle that, when applied to today's issue of same sex marriage, clearly. Uh, uh, defends the right of equality, right? That that we we do not discriminate on the basis of sex for access to fundamental rights. But that's not the test that Judge Barrett and at least five other justices on the court are going to use, as you point out. So basically, everything is at stake. I mean, we haven't even touched on our ability to fight yeah. the climate crisis. Uh, we haven't yet gotten the state church separation. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, I mean. E Everything is at stake. Uh, so, but let's so let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Amy Coney Barrett's record and her lifelong pattern of mm -hmm. saying that her religious beliefs should su supersede her oath of office. But first, um, we, we have to do this. We have to address this deliberately manufactured controversy um, that our side is opposed to Barrett because of anti-Catholic bigotry. So let's take a listen. This is the only example of anti-Catholic bigotry that we could find. Let's go ahead and play that clip, Bruce. The early church was corrupted by this Babylonian mystery religion. And today the Roman Catholic Church is the result of that corruption. Much of what you see in the Catholic Church today doesn't come from God's word. It comes from this cult-like pagan religion. Uh, you say, well, now, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? That is such an indictment of the Catholic Church. After all, the Catholic Church talks about God and the Bible and Jesus and the blood of Christ and salvation. Isn't that the genius of Satan? You know, if you want to counterfeit a dollar bill, 
You don't do it with purple paper and red ink. You're not going to fool anybody with that. But if you want to counterfeit money, what you do is make it look as closely related to the real thing as possible. And that's what Satan does with counterfeit religion. He uses, he steals, he appropriates all of the symbols of true biblical Christianity and he changes it just enough in order to cause people to miss eternal life. He's unbelievable. There is no anti-Catholic bigotry. If you look at prominent politicians and candidates on both sides, there are many Catholics. There are already five or six Catholics on the Supreme Court, depending on how you count Gorsuch. So this really is a manufactured media controversy deliberately intended to muzzle important questions about Barrett's alarming record. 100% agree with that. So, Andrew, you did a great job on opening arguments, walking listeners through how they can and should talk about this. It's not her Catholicism. It's this pattern of action that shows Barrett believing that her religion trumps her law. And this would be an issue no matter which God or religion she believed in. You know, we need to know whether she will uphold, uphold the Constitution or her holy book. Uh, So can you walk our viewers through this? And we do have some graphics to help because this is going to be we're breaking down (laughs) a long review article here. So let's go. So so first, there are actually two layers of attack here. Right. And they're both really insidious and they're they're easy to fall into the trap if 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 you're not aware. Right. So the first is Barrett's defenders are already out there right now poisoning the well. And what they are suggesting is if the Senate Judiciary Committee asks questions about Barrett's belief, they are violating Article six of the Constitution that forbids any religious test for public office. I had someone who is now a sitting judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals make that argument to my face in a public debate in 2018, even though that is the opposite of what Article 6 means. And the evidence I use. Let's pause and (laughs) let's name and shame Justin Walker there, because that is I mean, that is absolutely absurd. He he deserves it. Totally unqualified. Can look up FFR's uh, opposition to Walker. Um, should not be a sitting federal judge, let alone on the D.C. Circuit. Anyway, yeah, you, uh, this is, you can, this is the you can listen to you can listen to our episode of O.A. where, you know, the consequence of him uh, being humiliated in a public debate was being appointed for life to the federal bench. So I should lose more debates uh, is really what, what I <laughs> um, but but no, uh, it, it, when he said that, I, I was prepared for that with uh, an article you wrote. For FFRF on Article Six, so um, I, I couldn't say it any better than than you already have. So uh, why don't you explain that position because uh, your take is 100 percent correct. Yeah, I mean, our Article Six, no religious test for public office, is it's a it's a really remarkable piece of the Constitution. Um, it's very clear and it's expansive language. It's probably the most emphatic and clear um, statement, really, in the entire document. But it says no religious test shall be required for public office. And right before that, it says that you have to take this oath of office. You have to take an oath or affirm. And they ha- the judges have to be able to uphold that secular oath to be able to do their job. Article 6 doesn't mean that you can't ask people whether or not they have the wherewithal to do the job that they are being nominated for. It means that you can't you can't say, look, no Catholics are allowed in public office, right? Uh, that would be a religious test that would not be permissible. But saying, listen, you've written that your Catholic beliefs dictate you decide a case a certain way. How are you going to reconcile that when you get on the bench? That is something that others that the senators have a duty to ask because they have yeah. a duty to make sure that that person can uphold the oath. Yeah, no, that's right. And and the example I gave on OA that was utterly uncontroversial at the time was George Romney, Mitt Romney's dad, ran in the Republican primary in 1968 to be president of the United States. At that time, the and he's a Mormon like Mitt Romney. It, it, there's no law that says a Mormon can't be the Republican nominee, as was, you know, in 2012. There's no law that says a Mormon can't be president. But at the time, the Mormon church had a rule that forbade blacks 
from achieving the priesthood, which is a super important thing in Mormonism that all white boys got to do at age 13. But if you were African American, <laughs> you couldn't hold that. And and they didn't change that until Revelation, until 1973. And so 1968, kind of an important year for civil rights. And everybody agreed it's fair game to ask somebody who belongs to a church that had explicit racial discrimination built into its codicils, right? What's your position on that? It's exactly the same as asking George W. Bush about going to Bob Jones University, which prohibited interracial dating until up till and including the time that George W. Bush visited Bob Jones University. It's exactly the same as asking a candidate who belongs to a country club that is racially segregated, right? Like, these are not questions about faith. They are questions about fidelity to underlying constitutional principles. And again, maybe... Amy Coney Barrett has good answers to that. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk about her substantive answers in a minute. I'm skeptical, but 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 I want to point out, I, I you know, spoiler, spoiler. Alert, right? <laughs> but 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 I want to point out that the first battle, and you are gonna see this, and you're gonna have to push back against advocates. Is they are going to say asking the question is a kind of bigotry, and you need to push back and tell them that that's nonsense. You've got to find out. If this person endorses a position that is contrary to the the fundamental teachings of the Constitution, we have to know that. Asking the question is not a violation of the Constitution. It's not yeah. religious bigotry. Let me pause you for one second there, too, Andrew. If you are if you are watching this or listening to it, FFRF put out a, an aid for you to be able to have those arguments on our website. We linked you to a bunch of different op eds. We kind of broke this down very very short. Uh, it came out, I believe, on the twenty first or twenty second. Uh, it's under our news releases, uh, just says heads up, senators have a duty to ask about this. You go find it, educate yourself. But Andrew's going to educate you more right now. So you can just <laughs> listen to this too. Yeah, no, that is that is a terrific resource. So um, here's the question that the Senate Judiciary Committee needs to ask, and then they need to ask the appropriate follow-up questions. And that is, Judge Barrett, are there cases in which your personal beliefs be they religious or philosophical or otherwise in nature, would trump your oath of office to faithfully execute and uphold the laws of the, the United States and the Constitution of the United States of America. And the reason we need to ask that is because of what Amy Coney Barrett wrote in a 1998 Notre Dame Law Review article entitled Catholic Judges in Capital Cases. That law review article, again, l let's be fair, right? The article is 22 years ago when she was a clerk. She was a law clerk, right, before her career began. Uh, but it is one that she was asked about uh, when she was nominated to the Seventh Circuit. It is one uh, that, as far as we can tell, still applies to her beliefs today. And again, got to ask about it, right? Um, in that article, she argues that devout Catholics like herself should disregard the law in favor of her own personal beliefs when those two come into conflict. She begins by saying that the Catholic Church's teaching on the death penalty uh, is clear, right? And then she explains what she has to do. Quote, of course, judges often have to set aside their personal convictions to do justice, but this is easier in some cases than others. We can set aside our legal convictions in deference to a superior authority in the legal system, but the principle at stake in capital sentencing is a moral one, not a factual or simply legal one. And the judge is asked to violate it. There is no way the judge can do his job and obey his conscience. The judge's conscience tells him to impose a life sentence. Federal law directs him to impose death. Because the judge is unable to give the government the judgment to which it is entitled under the law, the appropriate statute, directs that judge to disqualify themselves. And then she adds, this is not a difficult case, right? And then... Uh, she goes through a multiplicity of scenarios, right, in terms of a judge upholding a jury verdict, a bench trial, even reviewing the sentence on appeal. In all of those cases, Judge Barrett comes to the same conclusion. And I, I, I want to read that to you again. Uh, it seems to us, then, that the proper approach to this kind of case, morally and legally, is for the observant Catholic judge to recuse themselves after trial and before the sentencing hearing. So that is Judge Barrett. Her words, you see them on the screen, saying that, one, sometimes you have sincerely held personal beliefs that prevent you from doing what the public law demands, which is fine. But two, in those instances, you are legally 
and morally obligated to recuse yourself from consideration. So we just need to ask Judge Barrett, do you agree with Amy Coney Barrett from 1998? (laughs) Well, and the two Andrews on this show have delved into her record a little bit more than I have in the last week. So I want to ask you, has she done that on the Seventh Circuit? Has she recused herself, for instance, on abortion cases? Um. I, that's a little bit of a softball question. Uh, no, um, I want to point out that it, and, and, and you asked the question about abortion and, and, it, and it's absolutely right to pivot from capital punishment to abortion because Judge Barrett, that that long passage that I just read on, and, I, and I'll, I'll spare you reading more, but uh, explicitly extends her argument from capital punishment to abortion in the same article, right? Because she criticizes at length Mario Cuomo, right, who was also a devout practicing Catholic, uh, who had the same position on abortion that uh, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has, right? Namely, which is while his church teaches against it, he has a responsibility in a pluralistic democracy to uphold the law rather than his religious convictions. And and uh, I guess I got to do it again. Here is word for word... <laughs> What what Judge Amy Coney Barrett has said about that, quote, we do not defend this position, right? That is the Cuomo Biden position as the proper response for a Catholic judge to take with respect to abortion or the death penalty. So, yes, that is Judge Barrett saying that devout Catholics like herself should follow the church's teachings and not the law when it comes to abortion specifically. And we just saw what those were, right? You have to recuse yourself from the case. You will not be surprised to learn that Judge Barrett, appointed directly to the Seventh Circuit, uh, has served there for almost three years now, has routinely voted in abortion cases. She has not recused herself. Um, In the the two principal cases that have come before her, she has dissented. And and, and this needs to be stressed because these two cases, I, I know this is a little bit of a legal technicality here, but these two cases are Planned Parenthood versus Commissioner and Planned Parenthood versus Box. And they both involve Indiana trap laws, right? That is efforts to try and restrict abortion by adding additional conditions on them. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of the law because both of those laws were square run, ran squarely afoul of precedent in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, right? It was clear the laws were unconstitutional. They were being teed up to give right-wing activists an opportunity to expand Casey and say, well, you know, parental notification laws have always required judicial bypass, but this one's okay even though it doesn't have it, right? That, yeah. that's I mean, actually saying, saying it another way is that these laws were, the law was very, very clear as to how these decisions should have come out. There, there was no yeah. wiggle room on them and Barrett still came out on the wrong side of it. Yeah. And, and, and and here's how clear it was. It was clear enough that, uh, the plaintiff went to federal district court at Planned Parenthood, went to federal district court in Indiana, got an injunction that was appealed to the seventh circuit, which sits in panel and the panel upheld the injunction. And then Indiana petitioned for what is called en banc review, which is to say the entire 11 judge Seventh Circuit should rehear the case and, you know, hopefully come out the other way. And in both cases, the Seventh Circuit was like, what are you talking about? This is a totally straightforward application of Planned Parenthood versus Casey. We're not going to be right wing activists that try and rewrite the Supreme Court. We're the Seventh Circuit. We don't get to do that. And both times, Amy Coney Barrett joined uh, an Easterbrook dissent. Uh, that basically said, yeah, but we'd like to rewrite the abortion laws. So um, it, th- this is th- these, so. So these are clear efforts to the contrary. And and Barrett did not just sign on to rehear on Bonk, but but signed on to uh, an opinion that uh, suggests that on the merits that those cases should have been reversed. And um, and that is terrifying. And there's a lot more. So. <laughs> You've broken down that law review. Great. I mean, I really appreciate it. But this is she's saying Catholic judges like herself are guided by their dogma and therefore they must recuse. And now we know she's refusing to recuse. So mm-hmm. already we know that her religion is deciding cases. And, and yep. that alone is a problem. But this is again, this is part of a well-developed pattern 
with Barrett. So I want to talk just about two other related things. Uh, and first, people have heard about this. This is her 2006 commencement speech at Notre Dame and then how it aligns with her membership in this group called People of Praise. And then we are going to take your questions. I promise. I know we're getting a ton actually already. So uh, strap in, folks. But so here is what Barrett said in that 2006 commencement address about using the law to build God's kingdom. Bruce, can we throw up that quote? And this is what you will always keep in mind that your legal career is but a means to an end. And as Father Jenkins told you this morning, that end is building the kingdom of God. Okay, so building the kingdom of God. You know, the, the same law are charged with maintaining the same ethical standards, will be entering the same kinds of legal jobs as your peers across the country. But if you can keep in mind that your fundamental purpose in life is not to be a lawyer, but to know, love and serve God, you'll truly be a different kind of lawyer. So uh, kingdom okay. of God. So so let me let me play a little bit of devil's advocate here, right? Because, yeah. you know, we, we 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 have three atheists on this panel. I have served uh, on boards, uh, you know, of, of, of public service organizations with Catholics. And, you know, right, none of us believe in this stuff. So it, it, the language seems a little kooky to us. But like, I, I have I, many of those people will use the language of kingdom of God to mean doing good for social justice in the world, right? Like it, it, it doesn't, it's not, and, and I think that it's really important um, to figure out what she means by that, right? Because I don't know, right? I, I do know that, that again, my Catholic friends use that differently than like R.J. Rush Dooney and the evangelical Christian dominion. Like they mean literal theocracy. Um, so, it, I mean, do we have any idea? If I'm, a, if I'm playing to judge barrett's defender here i'm gonna say yeah she just means you know feeding the poor and uh serving the public so do, do we know yeah we do and and uh. you're not the only one who's playing this i mean um uh jack jenkins religion news service did a whole exploration of just this phrase as did john fia a history professor who i two people i really really respect on this uh, but we, we did our own digging and Barrett is not a, a typical Catholic. She belongs to this group called People of Praise, which is a charismatic Catholic. It's been described by former members as a cult. Uh, it's a small group, less than 2,000 members. And as I understand it, it sits at this interesting, is the word I will choose to use, <laughs> confluence of Catholicism and sort of Pentecostalism. Uh, I mean, th they do speak in tongues, for instance. The AP just did, if you're interested, a really good story about this. Um, they do refer to their their female leaders as handmaids. They teach that uh, men have authority over women in even the, the smallest, smallest uh, choices that they have to make. Uh, there's a 1,500 word loyalty oath that members take. Uh, which is something uh, I'm a little bit alarmed about. And so th this is People of Praise. And they have a magazine that they put out. They talk about the kingdom of God pretty regularly in their magazine, building the kingdom of God, begging for the kingdom of God were two recent stories. And one month before Barrett's nomination to the Seventh Circuit, the magazine printed a, an excerpt of a speech that explained exactly what the group meant when it talked about the kingdom of God. And I want people to read this. Uh, so Bruce, go ahead and throw that up. God is really interested, not just in men's souls, but also in their whole life, work and enterprise. He wants all of it transformed into his kingdom. This means that what we often see as secular or worldly jobs, career, economic programs, public and private education, health services, criminal justice and the courts, Local, national, international politics and economics, questions of war, peace and justice, radio, TV, music and art, all are meant to be transformed into the kingdom of God in the earth. Now, I don't know how you sell that as metaphorical. That is, to me, as clear a statement of Christian nationalism and dominionism taking over everything as you could possibly get. Yeah, Rebecca, it looked like you wanted to jump in there. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, I've been, um, when you, when we've been talking about this, I've been trying to figure out, you know, my own Catholic upbringing, like, what did I think of Kingdom of God and what that meant? Um, but I, now, after 
um, my experiences and obviously working with FFRF, I hear kingdom of God. And I do think it's more of a theocracy than some, you know, doing social justice. And I think yeah, that I, but I think that's an important point because I think the main a mainline Catholic who was raised in this is going to have a different understanding of what that means than what Barrett actually does mean based on I mean and you know her dad was a part of this group runs it ran the the sect uh, or the group the splinter of it that was down in New Orleans I mean his, her mother was called a handmaid by in that same magazine in two thousand five I mean th this is a this has been part of their family for a while. Uh, she, we found out from her uh, Senate Judicial Questionnaire released this morning that Judge Barrett for three years served on the board of directors for Trinity Schools, which are a set of three schools run by people of praise, right? So this is not, uh, you know, th this is a deeply important part of her life. And again, I, I would subject it to the, to the George Romney question, right? Like this group explicitly teaches that women are to be subservient to men in areas of education, in areas of teaching. And if you make that black, right, if you if you for a second uh, replace women are to be subservient to men with blacks are to be subservient to white, like this, this nomination would be dead in the water, right? That there's you could not remotely defend it. And I I don't see the distinction. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the loyalty oath. This is the loyalty oath. Here's a here's a part of it from the AP story. Quote, we agree to obey the direction of the Holy Spirit manifested in and through these ministries in full harmony with the church. Uh, the AP also reports that at part of as part of the spiritual meetings, members often relay divine prophecies and are encouraged to pray in tongues, where participants make vocal utterances thought to carry direct teachings and instructions from God. Those utterances are then interpreted by senior male leaders and then relayed back to the wider group. This is something that is worth exploring. Yeah, I, okay. and I, I would just underline that last sentence, right? It, <laughs> our argument <laughs> is not that that you you instantly have to, to come to the same conclusion that, that we have, but that these questions have to be asked, and it's not bigotry to ask them. It is fidelity to the Constitution. That's great. We've, now, we've got a ton of questions. People are waiting patiently. So, uh, Rebecca, why don't you dive in and start, start uh, giving us some questions from these, these lovely people who have been staying with us. We've got a lot. There are a lot. Um, I'm pretty impressed. So Chris Cunliffe asks, so is it true that she has been judged for less than three years and people think she's qualified to be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's true that she's been a judge for less than three years. I don't know how much people think she's qualified because of that. She never tried an appellate case. Uh, Andrew, maybe you could speak to the big law record a little bit more. My understanding is she was uh, an actual lawyer for something of like two and a half years uh, before going directly into uh, the ivory tower that the conservatives hate so much. <laughs> so... Yeah, a quick rundown. She was first in her class at Notre Dame uh, in 1997, which is the same year I graduated from law school. So obviously I'm the underachiever here. Um, <laughs> uh, that's look, that is super impressive. Right. Academically, she has the credentials, in, in my view, to, to be on the Supreme Court. She was rated a majority uh, rated uh, by the ABA as well qualified uh, and a, a minority, a, a decent minority, rated qualified. And the way to interpret that is if you think about performance evaluations, right, like that is you're expected to exceed expectations, right? If you just get a whole bunch of meets expectations, that probably means you're not long for that world. So um, I think that's a fair evaluation, right? So she had two high profile clerkships, uh, a, a circuit court of appeals clerkship uh, and then uh, a clerkship for Antonin Scalia. She practiced for a couple of years at a big law firm and then was a law professor with distinction at Notre Dame, wrote a lot, taught real subjects, right? Unlike Justin Walker, who taught, you know, legal <laughs> advocacy and oral. I mean, she she taught Civ Pro. She taught con law. Um, it it I courts. don't think. Yeah, it, it, I don't think that the credentials avenue is is the right path to go down. I think it is the fidelity to the Constitution is 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 the right argument. Um, I agree with that. I agree with that. That that's the that's the concerning part. 
that, that I mean, and, and to me, it's 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 deeply, deeply alarming. That that's the part that we need to be focusing on. Don't worry so much yeah. about the other stuff. Yeah, because look, it when you nominate someone with a short judicial record to the bench, ordinarily the downside of that is well, they they may form that judicial temperament and and philosophy on the Supreme Court, and you know they may surprise you, uh, you know, a la uh, Justice Souter, uh, you know, ten twenty years down the road, um, with Judge Barrett, we have strong reasons to think that her guiding principles are not flexible because they're not subject to civic reinterpretation. They have been handed down from an unquestionable authority. So that that's much more my concern. All right. Well, our next question is from Jeannie R. She writes, she has said that she will recuse herself if she believes the Constitution conflicts with her religious beliefs. Have you seen any evidence of that in her time on the lower court? And is that really even possible? Kind of discuss that a little bit, but if you want to um, revisit it. Yeah, no, I mean, we've seen the opposite. We've seen evidence that she will not recuse herself in the cases where she said she should. Uh, and and recusal is is not... It's not the norm, but it's certainly something that happens in the courts. Um, and well, Andrew, why don't you why don't you tackle a little bit more about that? I mean, I, I she's she was clear though that she should recuse herself in certain cases, and then has not done that. Yeah, I think that's the best summary. I I would also add that Barrett's test that we talked about of when judges should recuse themselves uh, is not a test that any Supreme Court justice in modern history has ever applied. Right. So I, 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 I we, we did not see Antonin Scalia recusing himself from cases involving the Catholic Church. She has said, and I, and I do think this is the case, that she will recuse herself from cases involving Notre Dame, which is clearly, you know, a, a core personal part of her life. Um, and that's great and all, but that's not really what I'm worried about. Yeah, I mean, and I'm also worried about, you know, we, we were investigating, we're still investigating her links to this this private Christian school that apparently segregates kids based on sex and teaches that marriage is between man and woman and all kinds of other uh, weirdly repressed sexual teachings. Uh, the, the number of cases, big, important establishment clause cases, religious freedom cases that have come, real religious freedom cases that have come before the Supreme Court have involved private Christian schools, the Espinoza case that they just decided a couple of months ago, the Trinity Lutheran case, like, and she has been on the board for several years of these, these private Christian schools. It's difficult to imagine that that is not going to impact her rulings should one of those cases come back up. But again, you know, it, 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 just a lot to unpack and a lot to be worried about here. Yeah. So the next one is from Ann Bendixson. She asks, what can we learn about her from her appellate court decisions? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, she's again, she's not been on there for that long. Uh, this is going to be part of the full report that we have up on the FFRF website. We do list some of her uh, cases that she's decided, including the fact that she's very clearly hostile to reproductive rights, uh, the fact that she wants to strip health care from millions of Americans. She opposes giving legitimate First Amendment challenges to the government endorsing, uh, you know, religion. She wants to keep those out of court, uh, dismissing on standing grounds. Uh, seems to have not a whole lot of respect for precedent. Um, uh, has endorsed the sort of xenophobia, racism, bigotry of Christian nationalism uh, in in uh, you know one of the immigration cases, though not not as directly. Uh, so I mean, it, it is an alarming set of opinions. Allowed churches to to or thinks churches should be able to violate stay at home orders so they can meet during a pandemic and risk the lives and health of every citizen uh, in the in the area. Uh, so not not a record that I uh, am a fan of, even like a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let me say three things really, really quickly. Uh, 
First, if you listen to episode 424 of Opening Arguments, that's from last Friday, I talk about her opinion in Cantor versus Barr, in which she writes a dissent. It is a gun case, um, and, and basically it was a case involving a Wisconsin law that said felons can't own firearms. Uh, the panel was two conservative Republican appointees and Amy Coney Barrett, and she wrote the dissent, right? The, the two sort of mainstream Republicans said, yeah, well, look, like, who are we to tell Wisconsin that they can't prohibit felons from owning firearms? And uh, Judge Barrett's dissent is bananas in pajamas level crazy. I do not have time to break it down. I did talk about it on the show. That's sort of point one. Point two, she writes strangely for a judge the sort of i guess it, it goes into you know the the experience level but like when you read her opinions unlike gorsuch and kavanaugh who who wrote uh had a distinct style right gorsuch had a very scalia-esque sarcastic style kavanaugh has a very measured uh academic style amy coney barrett uses the word i more than any judge i have ever seen Right. Her opinions are, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to show this. I'm going to show that the dissent is. A and uh, yeah, so she's only written nine. She's only authored nine opinions in three years on the Seventh Circuit. And half of them have been designated as not for publication. So uh, I infer from that that she has tried to keep a low profile. Um, and that is because that that sort of gets to, to point number three. And again, I know I don't have enough time to, to break through this, but. Um, look up her dissent in Schmidt versus Foster. Um, this is an indefensible opinion, and, it, and it's and it's where she lays out her judicial philosophy very, very clearly. It is 100% Antonin Scalia's, we look to the original public meaning of the Constitution. And if you're asking, how do we know what the original public meaning of the Constitution is? It is whatever Judge Barrett thinks that the founding fathers would have thought in 1789 so long as it accords with conservative outcomes it, it, it's it's really kind of frightening well the next question um, might be a little no that's fine <laughs> um the next question might be a little tongue-in-cheek given um just the discussion we were just having but lawrence zucker I have no idea how to say that last name, so I'm sorry if I botched it. Um, Lawrence asks, given her beliefs, will be she give will she be giving opinions that are dictated by her husband, or will she be basing her opinions on the interpretation of law? I would direct everybody to the AP story about people of praise, the group that that she is a part of. Uh, we, you know, that it, to me, that story. Uh, should raise a lot of alarm bells for people. Go read. Go read. Barrett tied to faith group. It. I guess I want to stick up for for Judge Barrett here. I have, as part of researching this, I, I've watched a number of her presentations to the Federalist Society, speaking on panels, moderating debates, um, and and I think this is a very a profoundly intelligent woman who is living with a lot of cognitive dissonance and internal contradictions. So, I it I, again, I, I I agree with everything that Andrew just said, but but. Uh, I, it, she doesn't strike me as a as a as a Stepford wife or a puppet. No, I I agree with that for sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. and uh, also a little interesting tidbit from her questionnaire this morning that that we were chatting about on Twitter. Uh, dropped out of the Federalist Society uh, until <laughs> uh, what was it 2015, 2016, 2017? All of a sudden, she re-upped her membership uh, <laughs> as she was basically trying out for. Uh, federal judgeship, possibly the Supreme Court. And I mean, there there is something to be said. If you know your entire career is arcing towards a Supreme Court nomination, you don't say and do things that you think are going to get you into trouble. And the fact that she has said so much of this stuff, been open about it and spoken at, you know, the Alliance Defending Freedom's Blackstone Fellowship Program for several years. You know, this is another anti-gay hate group. Uh, that to me is also pretty interesting. And it's uh, well, I'll leave that there. Go ahead, Rebecca. Well, I think you guys are going to love this next question. Um, <laughs> so I'm really excited to hear your answers. Um, Simon Meager asks, historically, how have conservative majority Supreme Courts actually affected progress? 
Are there any examples of a SCOTUS going against the public good because they were majority <laughs> conservative? <laughs> I, uh, do you want to go first, Andrew, or you want me to? <laughs> I, yeah, well, we're, we're both going to say the same thing, which is one of the things that every law student learns in, in law school is that the most shameful era in the Supreme Court's history uh, was, it was a time called the Lochner era, right? The end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. It ended in 1937, uh, uh, apocryphally with... Uh, FDR's threat to pack the court. We could. Uh, we don't have time to unpack that that <laughs> analysis here. But but what the Lochner era court did was aggressively strike down legislation being passed by progressives at the dawn of the 20th century on things like mandatory minimum wage, maximum working hours, workplace conditions, the foundation for our modern liberal society. And if you were sitting there thinking. Is there precedent for a Supreme Court to openly undo all of the progress that a, 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 an administration and a Congress may do? Um, yes, we have 40 years of that in our nation's history. And it it looks like, I mean, you, you saw uh, the uh, Judge Barrett's discussion about the ACA. You saw it in the debate last night. Um, that that is the game to make it so that a right wing Supreme Court will undo whatever legislative progress that the people may vote into office. And by the way, the right wing argument is government doesn't work. So, you know, it feeds into their entire ideology to take the levers of power of one of the branches and break the other two. So, yeah, uh, so I that's a say, yes. Yeah, I, and I agree with all of what Andrew said. I'm going to go just a little bit broader and say that the, the Supreme Court is a conservative institution. Uh, I mean, and historically, I think that has been true across almost its entire existence. I mean, you get some really great times with like the Warren Court, for instance. But by and large, it is a pretty conservative institution uh, and change comes slower there than anywhere else. I agree with that. I think it, they're always they've always been behind public progress. Um, the next question, Jeremy Clark, do any of you think that term limit changes would be something possible and that may happen in our lifetime? Go ahead, Torres. Yeah, no, is the answer to that. Uh, it would require a constitutional amendment, and it is impossible to get a constitutional amendment passed because you only need 13 states to have a unified legislature and governor to, to block something. I mean, if we couldn't pass the Equal Rights Amendment, um, we're, we're not going to pass a term limits for Supreme Court justices. But, but... There's a lot of structural change that we can bring to the Supreme Court, a lot of structural change that we can bring to the Supreme Court. And that is something uh, that we are going to be looking about and talking about in the coming days. For instance, the, uh, most people know this by now, the number of justices is not set in the Constitution the way the lifetime appointment is. So we can have we could put 50 justices on the Supreme Court or 100 tomorrow, though we wouldn't want to do it tomorrow, probably, if we wanted to. <laughs> that could happen. Yeah. And and. That is true at every level of the judiciary, which yep. is tragically overworked. Anybody who practices law, left, right, center, will concede to you, right? My civil cases, when I file a motion, oh, that motion often sits for a year, right? Um, so certainly one of the things that uh, th that I think goes hand in hand with adding additional Supreme Court justices is doubling the size of the federal judiciary. Um, and, and, and that would help. Uh, to undo some of the damage that's been done over the past four years. So our last question, Corey James Foster asks, is there anything FFRF can do to stop or at the very least delay the nomination? So Corey, that's a really good question. And a lot of people are asking it and it's up to you. Right. You it's up to you to take action on this. Everybody needs to be picking up the phone and calling their senators, both of their senators, no matter how you think they are going to vote every single day. If you think they're going your way, give them support. If you think they're not, give them hell. It is up to you to do this. The only way we win this fight is if we actually fight. 
And, you know, you ask the question, is, is there anything FFRF can do? We're out there educating as much as we can, but it takes citizens to speak up. That is the only possible way we win this. You've got to pick up the phone and call. Yeah, and, and, and I want to underscore that. Pick up the phone and also put pen to paper. S your senators listen. They keep a tally of people who actually call their offices. They keep a tally of people who write letters. They do not care about emails or tweets or Facebook posts or memes that you share. That's not activism, right? That I mean, that might be stirring up your friends. And, uh, but, but if you want your voice to be heard, call and write. And, I, you know, I think the bigger question there, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, no, I was just going to underscore everything that you guys just said. And as a former Senate staffer, I would <laughs> hopefully agree. You call, tie up those phone lines um, and you write. And the more you can personalize it, the, the better, because um, those staffers know when they're getting form um letters and form emails and those are easier to tally but if i had to sit and figure out what you were writing about i spent more time on on your letter and um it was more likely to be in the pile that i would give to the senator to look at as the the sampling of what has been coming in from the constituency so um call write and personalize yeah the idea that your voice doesn't matter what is a lie that's put out there by people who don't want to hear it and don't want you to speak up you know, I think the bigger question that Corey was trying to get at is, can we win this fight? And this is far from over, right? We are only getting started. Nobody knows what is going to happen in the next month. People said that we would never save the Affordable Care Act in 2017, but we did. Remember what John McCain did? No. Right? We won that fight. Can we win now? Look, I don't know. I don't know if we can win this fight. I know that we cannot win if we do not fight. You have to fight. RBG made her entire legacy fighting against impossible odds and then not winning these hard cases immediately. That's why she's known for her awesome dissent color. She spent so much time dissenting. We <laughs> have to fight like she did. And we now we have to do it ruthlessly. This is not just a battle for her seat. This is a war for our judiciary. It's bigger than Barrett. This is about justice, right? And FFRF, we are never going to stop fighting for that. I hope you join us. Here, here. And that is Ask an Atheist for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Thank Andrew, you, Andrew for joining us. Oh, thanks um, for having me. Amazing having you here. And um, I was really excited for you to join us and answer questions. And this was a fabulous show. So thank you very much. The first so of many times. Check, right. Please check out his podcast, Opening Arguments. It is phenomenal. Um, and if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, please check out our website at FFRF.org. We'll be back next Wednesday at noon central with another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. <laughs> <laughs>